Hello students, we are going to continue from where we left off from the lecture on Tuesday, right? So let us begin with parts B uh, from activity 3. So for parts B, we are going to introduce you to arrow pushing in organic chemistry. This is a little bit uh, difficult and um, it's something which your seniors uh, often find it a little bit challenging to deal with yeah but um, not to worry because uh, we will begin by uh, showing you how to connect the dots uh, between each structure that's why we have a part b here you are not required to draw the structures but you are simply required to put in the curly arrows right then um, if you if you just look at uh, the relevant portion in your lecture notes where we introduce you to reaction mechanism drawing uh, please take notes of some of the rules uh, given there so for example uh, elements such as oxygen carbons and nitrogen they should always have the octet configuration uh, they should not have more than 10 electrons because they are in period 2 and it's not able to expand octets elements such as nitrogen it is okay for it to take on one less electron say seven um, in some cases yeah, but definitely not 9 electrons or even 10 electrons. Yeah, elements such as in this case sulfur, sulfur over here, can have more than 10 electrons if um, situation permits. Yeah, so some of these rules uh, you need to be aware of. And uh, rules such as you begin from electron rich region, usually pi bonds or lone pairs of electrons, and then you end up with electron deficient region. Electron re deficient region is uh, also known as electron sink. Okay, so we'll first begin with question one. So we have dimethyl sulfoxide. This is usually used as a solvent. Okay, so uh, first we'll showcase the heterolytic bond breaking of the pi bond because over here you can see that over here you can see that uh, there's a charge separation between the sulfur and oxygen and then of course there's an extra lone pair here we did not draw in the rest of the lone pairs of electrons because it may not be very necessary okay so we will first break this bond heterolytically okay so uh, in this case sulfur will take on uh, a negative charge Sorry, uh, oxygen will take on a negative charge, sulfur will take on a positive charge. And then with the lone pairs of electrons on oxygen, we will check against the, stru the structure on the right hand side. You notice that now the carbon oxygen over here takes on a negative charge. Yeah, so you would expect this to be some, for some sort of a nucleophilic attack. So you will draw this lone pair of electrons towards the carbonyl carbon and then the pi bond will now break towards the carbonyl oxygen yep then after that uh, what you are going to expect is that you notice that the carbonyl carbon is now regenerated uh, from this and then um, the chloride is gone yeah so uh, this is a classic example of what we call an addition elimination reaction yeah where first step is an addition involving a nucleophilic attack of a nucleophile onto an electron deficient site and then the pi bond break towards the more electronegative element in this case oxygen and then now the pi bond is reformed and then the chloride is now being kicked off yep and this is um what we get on the uh on the structure on the right yep and then you notice uh something quite interesting let me just erase this first so that uh, you don't get confused by the highlights okay now, uh, a CO2 is being expelled out as well as a CO. Yeah. And then you notice that the structure on the right hand side is a pretty simple structure. Yeah. So uh, basically just consists of this particular group like this and uh, like this. Okay. Yeah. So something must have happened uh, to drive out uh, the CO2 and CO. Okay. So if we scrutinize the whole structure you notice that now the chloride is bonded to sulfur so I expect perhaps a nucleophilic attack of the chloride onto this particular sulfur and this nucleophilic attack will result in the expulsion of CO2 so in this case I expect the CO2 to come from here because you can take note of the structural similarity and of course the CO to come from here 
Okay, so let us try to draw out the mechanism from here. So now the chloride performs a nucleophilic attack on sulfur. Then I'm expelling out the CO2. So the SO bond will now form the pi bond like this. Okay, yeah, and that is how the CO2 is being expelled out. And then the CC bond will now break towards the carbon over here. Okay, and that is how I produce the CO. Okay, and of course, when I break towards the carbon, the carbon already have eight electrons uh, in this particular structure. And remember that I need to generate the chloride. So therefore, I expect the CCL bond to break towards the CL. Okay, then if I'm going to sketch out the structure for CO here, I'm going to put in the lone pairs of electrons so we can do some um, electronic bookkeeping, right? You'll notice that now I have a oxygen here with two lone pairs, then I have a CO uh, pi bond, okay? And of course now, because the uh, CC sigma bond break towards the carbon, you'll notice that my carbon only has six electrons around it. Okay, do you notice that? Okay, so maybe I'm going to just um, do a very simple illustration. Okay, so originally there's a sigma bond here and there's a sigma bond to the CL, right? Okay, so uh, in terms of the uh, bond breakage, this sigma bond now break towards the carbon. It reforms the lone pair, okay, which is what I've shown earlier on. And then after that, now the CCL break towards the CL. Yeah, so in this case, my carbon over here is indeed electron deficient. So I'm going to just draw it out, electron deficient, uh, with only six electrons around it. And you know that CO taking on this structure is not likely to be very stable. Yeah, so uh, it's likely to um, form another pi bond. I think all of us are aware that CO uh, triple bond is one of the strongest in the world. And then I'm going to reform the pi bond here. Yeah, so I'm going to draw a resonance structures uh, maybe to the uh, right hand side okay so uh, what I'm going to get is um, a CO with a triple bond and then a plus here and a minus here okay so this is the usual CO which we are comfortable with and I'm going to highlight um, in orange in red sorry yeah okay so I hope uh, this is okay with most of you I know this is a bit difficult but I hope the explanation does help a bit Okay, then I'm going to move on to the to the next structure so as to complete the mechanism. Okay, and of course now the chloride is off and then I have um, another alcohol here. So this is um, another alcohol which uh, can potentially come in. Okay, so I'm going to just highlight in purple. So this particular alcohol will come in um, here. It's now this particular structure. Okay, then um, what is likely um, to happen is that the, the lone pairs on the alcohol will then perform a nucleophilic attack on the sulfur and then the chloride will leave. Okay, yeah, so when this happens, um, this chloride will be here. Okay, um, apologies that there's a typo here. Um, there shouldn't be a H, so I'm just going to erase the H, okay, and then I'm going to replace it with a plus positive formal charge. Why, why does it have a positive formal charge? Because originally sulfur has three single bonds and then the chloride leaves and then now uh, it contains another three single bonds. So of course it will take on a positive formal charge. Okay, and then um, what is going to be interesting here? So let me just um, erase the circle. Okay, what's going to be interesting here is that um, the chloride will now um, play a role in abstracting the H Okay, and in the process, I'm going to neutralize the uh, positive charge on the oxygen. So uh, this is the structure I'm going to come up with. Okay, maybe I can just highlight again so that um, it's very clear to you. Okay, and then um, from here, let us compare the structure on the left. Okay, I have trimethylamine. This is usually a solvent as well. This is known as trimethylamine because the nitrogen is a tertiary amine bonded to three methyl groups. Okay. This is likely to abstract, okay, uh, H here. Uh, why is this H acidic? Well, because um, the CH3 is next to an S with a positive charge. So this particular S with a positive charge is likely to be electron withdrawing, okay? 
Okay, so uh, it's a, some sort of an acid-base neutralization reaction. And then when that happens, I'm going to form the pi bond with sulfur. And that's how I'm going to end up with this particular structure. So I'm going to uh, highlight this again in purple. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that... Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a plus charge missing. Okay, so I'm going to uh, incorporate in over here. Okay, I'm going to put a H here. My apologies. Okay, yeah. Then um, what is going to happen here is that I'm going to uh, perform some rearrangement because eventually, right, you notice that uh, this structure is oxidized to a ketone. Yeah, so in short, um, if I can just connect the dots a little bit, uh, this particular alcohol eventually gets oxidized to a ketone. Yeah, so this reaction is the famous Swan oxidation. If you are interested, you can go and find out a little bit more. So I repeat this. This particular uh, reaction is the famous Swan oxidation. Okay, so what is going to um, happen uh, in the last step? Well, I think the first thing which you might be aware of is that probably I need to form a CO pi bond. Okay, so uh, in order to form the CO pi bond, this particular hydrogen is likely to be lost as a H plus, and I'm going to regenerate a uh, dimethyl sulfide here. Yeah, so therefore I, I mean what I can envision would be this particular pi bond will abstract the H. Okay. And in the process of abstracting the H, um, the CH bond will break and form the pi bond. And oxygen um, already have octet configuration, right? So now I will break towards the sulfur. And in the process, it will generate this particular lone pairs of electrons. Okay, Ken? So uh, I'm going to highlight the lone pair over here. Yeah, so um, the past... Uh, 10 plus minutes, I've explained how to draw the mechanism to Swan oxidation. Okay, uh, maybe let me repeat, you are not expected to know the mechanism to Swan oxidation. This is purely a mechanism drawing exercise. Okay, so not to worry so much. Right, next we are going to move on to question two. Okay, so for question two, um, for each of the following reactions, you are supposed to supply the missing charges, lone pairs of electrons, and then use curly arrows to show the bond breaking and forming uh, for each step. Yeah, so I think uh, this no, this needs no introduction. Yeah, uh, if you recall what I mentioned to you earlier on, this is similar to uh, this particular step, uh, what we call uh, addition elimination okay so uh, I'm going to do the same thing so I will need a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen so I will perform a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl uh, carbon and then the pi bond the CO pi bond will break towards the oxygen okay because of this my oxygen will gain a negative charge my nitrogen will gain a positive charge yep and then uh, after that you notice that the chloride is lost so um, how can I lose the chloride? Uh, the lone pairs of electrons on oxygen okay, will come in and reform the pi bond and then in the process I will kick out the chloride. So the chloride will take on a negative charge and then uh, not to forget the nitrogen here because it is uh, forming four sigma bonds so it will take on a plus one charge. Okay, then um, the other uh, ammonia here Okay, we'll then grab one of the uh, H plus from the NH3 plus. So um, what you probably want to do, right, is maybe I'm going to use, um, I'm going, just going to erase this. And then I'm just going to uh, draw out the H here with plus charge. Okay, H, H and H. Yeah, it's uh, important to draw out the sigma bond so that uh, you show clearly the bond breaking process. Okay, so now uh, the lone pair will at attack one of the H. Uh, that's how you form the ammonium with a plus charge. And then the chloride now will have a negative charge, okay? And then the NH pi sigma bond, sorry, will break towards the N and then give you back the neutral amides. Yeah, so this is uh, what exactly is happening over here. Okay, then in parts B, you, you do notice um, something quite interesting. 
uh, eventually um, I'm getting uh, this structure seems a bit naked so of course the, the CL cannot be lost as a radical so it is likely to be sort of as N1 like yeah so the CCL bond will now break towards the CL and then in the process I will generate a carbo cation over here and then of course the chloride will take on a lone pair of electrons with a minus charged right and then um, in the process uh, there will be a H over here that will be lost how do I know the H will be lost because eventually uh, I need to form the CC pi bond which is over here so in order to form the CC pi bond uh, the lone pairs of electrons on uh, H2O, right, will need to perform uh, an acid base attack or a nucleophilic attack on this particular Lewis acidic hydrogen. And then the CH sigma bond will now break towards the CC to form back the pi bond. And then, of course, this H3O must come with a plus charge. Yep. Okay. Then um, next, I'm going to look at uh, part C. Part C is um, a little bit interesting, okay? But first of all, uh, we need to form this uh, weird-looking um, intermediate with a cyclic structure. This is known as a cyclic bromonium, okay? Yeah, so uh, because now my bromine has one extra sigma bond, so uh, if you calculate the former charge, it, it should take on a plus one uh, former charge. And then uh, what I'm going to do here now, what I'm going to do is the pi bond will not attack one of the bromine to form the bromide or rather to be attached to the carbon over here and then the brbr will now break towards the next the second bromine and then of course this bromine uh, will be in the form of a bromide uh, it will have a lone pair of electrons yeah um, some of you might be wondering um, isn't this similar to electrophilic addition uh, the one uh, I've learned in or you guys have learned in H2 uh, yes yeah so um, so what exactly is happening here is that uh, I'm just going to draw a simplified structure over here okay so um, the BR is now attached to one of the carbon and then of course you form a carbocation over here right yeah but um, later on you're going to learn that for electrophilic addition especially those involving bromine right uh, this particular structure is not very stable. So what will happen is that the lone pairs of electrons on bromine will now perform a nucleophilic attack on the electron deficient carbocation. Yeah, it seems to be a separate step, but in reality, uh, it happens together. So this lone pair will simultaneously form a bond with this particular carbon. And that's how you end up with a cyclic bromonium. Okay. If you forget your former charge, maybe I can uh, do a quick um, recap so that you understand how to um, calculate former charge and why the bromine here has a plus one former charge. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to showcase a dot and cross diagram uh, just for this particular portion, okay, on the right hand side. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw out a bromine here and then um, like this okay and then um, with a uh, carbon here okay and of course uh, this particular uh, carbon will now um, bonded to um, or rather this particular bromine will then uh, be bonded to another carbon so maybe I'm going to erase this and and put in the, the other carbon here okay so that is more clear cut and then um, you guys will be able to see um, the difference okay then of course um, uh, it's going to form um, a sigma bond um, with another carbon uh, that is far away okay uh, essentially we are talking about let's say I'm going to number it one two three uh, four right so um, this will be carbon one this will be carbon two and then carbon three and then the next one will be carbon four um, which I'm going to put here like this so I'm not exactly interested in carbon 1 and 4 and of course 2 and 3 as well but I'm just going to uh, label it nonetheless and then um, I'm going to indicate the H as well yeah remember that um, in the cyclic bromonium the carbon also contains a H okay yeah um, a structure that look uh, 
like this. I hope um, it is kind of okay. Yep. And then, um, so right now, let us attempt to calculate the former charges. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. I think the first thing a lot of you um, might be asking, I'm sure that question will come is, eh, um, wouldn't bromine have seven electrons? How come now my bromine only has uh, six crosses? Yeah, that is a question uh, which some of you, um, although you didn't ask, but I'm sure you have. Okay, the reason is this. Um, because I'm being a little bit biased here, I'm, I'm just showing you a perfect um, dot cross diagram. But uh, actually, this carbon, right? If you, if you look at the particular structure I've drawn above, um, this particular bond is likely to be a dative covalent bond. But as I said, when we draw formal charge, we really don't care whether is it dative or whether is it um, a, a, a normal uh, sigma bond. It doesn't really matter. Lah. Yeah. So, uh, but what really matters is that we, we have a structure that is like this and originally um, one of the electrons um, is lost somewhere. Okay, so now if I'm going to uh, divide up the, the structure, assuming a perfect covalent model. So I'm going to just cut like this. So if I'm going to cut like this, assuming a perfect uh, covalent model, originally bromine has seven electrons. Now bromine has only six. Therefore, it takes on a plus one formal charge. Okay. Of course, you can argue it from another perspective. Lah. I mean, you can argue that uh, maybe for the whole structure, one of the atom loses the one electrons. Yeah, I mean, you can you can look at it that way as well. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Like what I often say, all road leads to Rome. As long as you are very clear what you're doing, then um, you should be fine. Okay, yeah. Then from here onwards, um, uh, what is uh, really, really important is I need to continue the number, the carbons, okay, in order to, uh, to get the structure which... Um, I am comfortable with. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I have 5, uh, 6, uh, 7, and 8. You notice that uh, carbon number 7 and 6 is bonded to the secondary amine. Yeah, that is something um, I, I really need you to, to take note of. And carbon number 4 is bonded to a methyl group over here. So there's a methyl group over here. Yeah, so if we try, uh, I would expect this to be carbon number 4. Okay, and then uh, 5, and then 6, and it makes sense because 6 is bonded to nitrogen. And then after that, we have carbon number 7, and carbon number 8, and then we have 1, uh, 2, and 3. Okay, now, how do we end up with a structure like this? Okay, we end up with a structure like this because the lone pairs of electrons on this secondary amine compete with the bromide nucleophile over here yeah so it will then perform a nucleophilic attack on carbon number two and then the cbr bond break towards the bromine yeah so in the process carbon number three takes the bromine and carbon number two is directly bonded to the nitrogen and of course this nitrogen has four bonds so it will take on a positive charged okay and then of course the bromide um, being the conjugate base of hbr will then grab the h and then now the NH bond will break towards the nitrogen. And then the final structure is the one shown on the left. Yep. Okay, so I hope this is uh, okay. Yep. I don't think um, um, it's too difficult, but um, just take note of some of the processes which um, I've highlighted. Okay, then moving on to um, part D. Okay, so for part D, um, yeah, we have this particular nitro group. Okay, so remember that whenever you have a nitro group, it will be good to put in the former charge at the nitrogen, okay, as well as the oxygen here. Yeah, because uh, some of you might be uh, familiar that the lone pairs of electrons on nitrogen can delocalize across the NO. Yeah, but this is not crucial in our uh, drawing um, for this particular question. Uh. So I just put in the, the plus minus um, for you to, to take note of. So I'm just going to put it in to remind you that there's a plus minus, okay? And then what's going to happen is that this is a classic example of what we call alkaline hydrolysis. So again, um, this is the carbonyl carbon with the oxygen. So I'm going to expect the lone pairs of electrons 
on hydroxide okay to perform a nucleophilic attack on the carbon and then uh, the pi bond will now break towards the oxygen yeah so this will take on a negative charge okay and then after that um, the pi bond will be reformed and then I will then kick out the O methyl group as the leaving group and of course the O methyl group taking on a negative charge is the conjugate base of methanol which is a relatively weak acid so itself is a strong base so therefore it is likely to grab this particular H so I'm going to draw out the CH sigma bond okay and um, it's going to perform a nucleophilic attack uh, grab the H and then now the OH bond will now break towards the oxygen so the oxygen will take on a negative charge okay yeah so uh, this is exactly how it works but if you strictly follow our discussion on electron source and electron sink, uh, it shouldn't just break towards the oxygen. Okay, so uh, you should be looking at um, the OH bond will now break towards the CO sigma bond here and then the CO pi will break towards the oxygen, the carbonyl oxygen. So this is known as an electron uh, sink. Yeah, so um, what, what you're expecting is that um, I am allowing the electron to flow from the electron source okay all the way to the electron sink which is the carbonyl oxygen yeah but it is okay if you just break towards the O next to the H to form the carboxylate it is perfectly fine but uh, you will see some online resources that will break all the way towards the carbonyl oxygen yep okay so for the final example we have this okay so what's going to happen is that um, first I need to know what happens yeah so I form a CC double bond here there's an O seems to be a little bit naked but of course the since the H is being drawn out I'm going to uh, showcase the lone pair on the hydroxide and then I'm going to um, grab this hydrogen which is likely to be acidic and then um, I'm going to form the CC uh, double bond and then now I'm going to break towards the oxygen okay yeah so this is known as deprotonation of the alpha proton in a carbonyl compound okay then uh, of course uh, you expect this oxygen to take on the negative charge okay and then of course um, because it's an acid based reaction I will end up with H2O here okay and eventually right what I'm what's going to happen is that uh, this particular carbon um, is actually nucleophilic this is known as an enol enolates so if i'm going to do a carbon count right um it will be um i'm going to have like one two uh three uh four uh five and six okay so uh what is uh going to happen is that um one two three four uh five six yeah so carbon one being the nucleophilic carbon right will perform a nucleophilic attack on the the other carbonyl carbon which is carbon number five and then the co uh, pi bond will break towards the oxygen okay so i'm going to draw the mechanism out so lone pairs of electrons no reform the pi bond uh the enolates uh being electron rich at carbon number one will then perform a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon which is carbon number five and then co pi bond will break towards the oxygen and this is what i'm going to get with a negative charge okay and then of course here it will be the normal um, acid based neutralization reaction where i will grab a proton from h2o and then i will form the hydroxide anion okay and then um, what is going to happen here is that the lone pairs of electrons on oh minus if you compare the structure on the left hand side this is likely to take on a negative charge as well will grab um, one of the protons and then now um, the ch bond will now be pushed to form the CC pi bond and then um, the CO pi bond will now break towards the carbonyl oxygen okay and then uh, what's going to happen is that now the lone pairs of electrons on um, the oxides or this particular enolate will be reformed because over here is reformed and then the pi bond will be reformed at the other side to form the conjugates ketone or what we call the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl yeah this particular compound is known as alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl okay why is it called alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl because this is known as a carbonyl uh, group and then the carbon next to it is known as alpha carbon the carbon next to alpha carbon is called a beta carbon so the alpha beta carbon 
has a CC double bond and it is conjugated with the CO carbonyl group. And then in the process, now uh, I will form the OH minus. Yeah, you notice that uh, it's a very smooth arrow pushing. Lone pair electron reform the CO double bond. And then uh, the pi bond shift to form CC double bond at the other beta carbon. And then now the beta carbon, uh, the CO sigma bond break towards the OH, giving us OH minus. Yeah, this mechanism is known as first order elimination conjugate base. Okay, it's not in your H2 curriculum. Uh, not to worry, but I just introduce it to you over here as an arrow pushing exercise. Why is it called first order elimination conjugate base? Um, you'll notice that in this particular step, right, I do not grab a proton and then just kick out the OH minus. Yeah, I push the electron towards the electron sink, which is at the carbonyl oxygen. Yeah, so this is a characteristic of uh, this particular reaction because first I need to push electron density towards the electron sink and then from the electron sink I push back to eject out the living group yeah so uh, in the future if you encounter a mechanism uh, similar to this I hope you are not too shocked by it and then um, yeah, but uh, of course, to be fair, you are not required to know this for H3 curriculum. So this is uh, definitely something which I will emphasize. Next, let us take a look at uh, activity four. Yesterday's lecture, I stopped at uh, question three. Yep. So actually, I went all the way to uh, around question, um, I think it's question nine. And then after that, um, I mentioned that I'll return to question three when we have the time. So in the very last uh, five to ten minutes, we squeeze out a little bit of time and then we had a bit of discussion. Yep. Then after the lecture, I think some of you came to me and asked me, uh, hey, why is it that when x is equals to h, I concluded that it's more Sn2 than Sn1? Yeah, so um, after thinking for a while and then after having a bit of discussion with some of you guys, I, uh, my apologies, I think uh, in, in the process of concluding this um, over a very short period of time, uh, I shouldn't be saying more Sn2 than Sn1. If you scrutinize the whole thing, uh, it's actually more Sn1 than Sn2 if you look at it. So it's more um, Sn1 uh, than Sn2. Yeah, so we are look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you two extreme scenarios. So let's say we are talking about more Sn1 than Sn2. Um, what are we uh, expecting? So how many percent are we expecting for SN1? How many percent are we expecting for SN2? So we are expecting around 82% of SN1 and around 18% of SN2. Why is that the case? Yeah, Because SN1 occurs via a carbocationic intermediate. So in that case, the nucleophile, uh, which is water in our case here, has near equal probability of approaching from the top and bottom plane. Yeah, so I would expect from the 82%, 41% of it will approach from the top plane. So in this case, no inversion. And another 41% of it will approach from the bottom plane. And coupled from the 18% of SN2, which is a pure uh, stereochemical inversion, I add the two together. So over here, I'm getting 59%. Yeah. So from here, I can kind of conclude that there's more SN1 than SN2 and then that explains why the ratio is like this. Okay, uh, some of you also come up to me, uh, you you were not very comfortable, you were saying that um, why is it a very weird ratio of 41 to 59? Are we able to predict the ratio? So the truth is uh, we are not able to predict this particular ratio. These are all experimental data. We can only you know account for it um, using our conceptual understanding of how the mechanism works. But we cannot say for sure that it is indeed more SN1 than SN2. It could be a pure SN1. Okay? Then some of you might ask, eh, if it's a pure SN1, wouldn't we get uh, like X equals to O methoxy? We should be getting 50-50, right? Uh, no. If it's a pure SN1, right, 
there is another effect which is not being introduced to you in H2, but uh, I think in H3, if you look towards the um, the back portion of the notes, we talk about something known as an ion pair effect. Yeah, so what exactly is the ion pair effect? Okay, so maybe I can illustrate it over here, but before I illustrate, I need to erase um, some of this messy stuff. Okay, so the ion pair effect kind of like work like this. So I have a flat... I have a flat fennel ring. Okay, then um, I'm getting a carbon here. Okay, uh, I have a methyl group projecting in and then a H uh, projecting out. Okay, so the ion pair effect is like when the Cl minus leaves, right? It's actually pretty near the carbocation. So that means that the nuclear file, when it approaches from the top plane, it will be kind of blocked by the... Um, leaving group in this case the chloride so in that case there is a slightly greater percentage of attack from the bottom plane this is known as an ion pair effect which means right uh there exists an intermediate uh beyond the carbocation intermediate so this particular intermediate has the chloride being relatively close to the secondary carbocation yeah so this ion pair effect will sort of block the attack uh by the h2o from the top plane Okay, yeah, so uh, do take note of this. So when you get a percentage that it's skewed towards one end, but, um, you know, it's not very extreme like that of uh, X equals to NO2, then you can kind of conclude that oh, maybe the ion pair effect is at work. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that I, I hope that explains uh, why when X equals to H and when X equals to O uh, methoxy, um, we're expecting a scenario like this. Of course, when X is equal to NO2, uh, as what we have discussed earlier on, you get about 50% as N2 and 50% as N1. Yeah, again, it's about there. Probably some ion pair effect is at play, but I doubt so because the presence of an electron withdrawing NO2 group uh, does destabilize the carbocation intermediate. So uh, we are really not expecting a carbocation to um, even exist um, appreciably. Okay, yeah, so um, with that, I think um, I'm quite done with question three. So uh, we'll move on to the to the last bit, uh, which is on section four. So I'm just going to scroll through part D. Uh, section four is on solvent effects. Um, maybe I can emphasize that solvent effect is not in the H3 curriculum. Yeah, it used to be in the old H3 pharmaceutical camp, but uh, it has since been taken out. But However, we thought that uh, we want to introduce solvent effect to you so that you do understand uh, or rather it gives you a complete view of uh, the difference between SN2 and SN1. And I think uh, next time in a, in a question setting, if they provide you with some context, at least when you look at the context, you are not so lost. Okay, yeah. So um, before we move into solvent pair effect, I need to introduce you to... Um, three terms so um, first of all is what we call a polar protic solvent so a polar protic solvent are solvents capable of forming hydrogen bonds uh, via the OH and NH that means that they have protonic hydrogen okay so uh, let me introduce you to this particular term they have what we call protonic hydrogen okay so the presence of protonic hydrogen um, allows um, hydrogen bonds to be formed between cations and anions. That's why we say that pro polar protic solvent is able to solve it both cations and anions uh, well. Okay, there's another term which uh, you need to be familiar with. It's known as polar aprotic solvent. Okay, so the difference between protic and aprotic is that protic solvent can form hydrogen bonds, but aprotic solvent cannot form hydrogen bonds. And therefore, aprotic solvent uh, do not have protonic hydrogens. Yeah, but nonetheless, these solvents are polar due to a net dipole moment. Yeah, so they do not contain OH and NH. They solve it cations well, but not anions. Yeah, do take note of this. Some of you might be wondering why. You can think about it, and then we can have an offline discussion. And then, uh, of course, the final category is non-polar solvent. I don't think this need any uh, further introduction. Yeah, so basically, non-polar solvent are aprotic. So that's why we don't call it non-polar aprotic. Yeah, okay. And then um, next, uh, you're supposed to label uh, these solvents as polar protic, polar A protic, and uh, non-polar. Okay, so uh, how do we uh, label it? 
uh, in that sense okay uh, I think we are familiar with water so maybe uh, I will highlight so that it's easier okay so for polar protein it will be a pink highlights um, polar a protein yellow and non polar I'll do with a green okay so in that uh, in that case I'll start with polar protein okay so of course water is polar protein um, ethanol as well because they all contain uh, protonic hydrogens as well as ethanoic acids um, if I'm going to move through this particular category then none of it are considered polar protein okay for polar a protein these are polar solvents so definitely not hexane because hexane is considered non-polar so we have a uh, proper known um, over here right and then um, we have um, CH3, Cl3, and then uh, we have cyanomethane, um, uh, and then of course uh, HMPA, uh, DMSO, ether, DMF, all these are considered polar a protein, which means they, they are uh, solvents with a net dipole moment, but they do not contain protonic hydrogens. Yeah, so uh, in that sense, they are able to solve cations well. Okay, and then um, the final bits would be uh, non-polar. So of course, hexane is non-polar uh, because it's largely L LQ non-polar uh, contains a lot more non-polar CHCC groups. Liquid CO two as well because no net dipole moments, and then um, tetrachloromethane no net dipole as well, and then uh, benzene. Okay, yeah, so I hope the categorization does help you to uh, understand a little bit more about the classification of solvents, whether they are polar proteins, polar A proteins, or non polar. Right. Next, we'll move on to question 11. So we have this table uh, giving us the relative rates of SN2 for uh, one bromobutane. So this is a primary uh, bromoalkane. Okay, so bromobutane, we're using azite, so this is known as azite um, as the nucleophile um, in different solvents. Okay, so using the information in table 5 and the two scenarios given in the preamble, briefly explain how the change, oh, there's a, a typo here, so how the change in solvents, not living groups, okay, how the change in solvents affects the rate of SN2. A sketch of the energy profile diagram is useful in supporting your explanation. So um, from the two scenarios, we need to decide is it scenario 1 or scenario 2, which one is better able to help us explain the relative rates. So first of all, we have to categorize them. So I will use the same uh, label. Yeah. So for polar protic solvent, I'm going to highlight in pink. And then for polar a protic solvents uh, in yellow, so these are all polar a protic solvents. So remember that polar a protic solvents can only solvate cations well, cannot solvate anions. Okay, so um, maybe we can just um, uh, put it over here. So uh, does not solvate anions well. Okay, so uh, these two solvate and ions well. Okay, so first of all, maybe we can look at the structure of azites. Yeah, so if you watched the earlier videos on uh, drawing the dot and cross diagram for azite and how do you translate into um, the more stable or the, the better Lewis structure, uh, you will know that azite looks like this. Okay, with a triple, with a double bond, um, and then with a plus um, in the middle, and then um, two minus on the left and right. Okay, like this. So you notice that it has a negative charge on both ends. So that means that if I have a water molecules over here with a delta minus delta plus, it's able to be well solvated via ion dipole interaction or hydrogen bonding. Okay, so we can uh, draw the interaction uh, nicely over here. So these are, uh, you can call it ion dipole interaction or hydrogen bondings, but, but usually uh, we will tend to call it uh, hydrogen bonding. Okay, so, so yes, so in this case, this particular solvation will stabilize your 
uh, an ion, in this case the azide nucleophile very well. So if we look back at the scenarios, right, we are really looking at um, scenario one because the solvation of the N ion um, by the solvent, right, will resemble that of pathway one. Yeah, because the energy of the nucleophile um, is not that energetic. So it's quite low in energy because it's well solvated. That means that the lone pairs of electrons uh, cannot approach the uh, electron deficient center of the halogenal alkanes uh, well because it's so-called well solvated. So uh, in the language of chemistry over here, we say that it is not very naked or is less naked as compared to, let's say, I'm going to put my azide in a polar a protic solvent where um, the solvent cannot solvate the N ions well. So that means that if the solvents cannot uh, solvate the N ions well, the lone pairs of electrons will be highly available to be donated to an electron deficient carbon. Yeah. Okay. So that will resemble pathway two. Okay, so um, some of you might be wondering um, why is it that for polar aprotic solvent they are not able to solvate um, the N ions well? Well, I mean, um, if I just randomly pick any of the polar aprotic solvent, let's say I'm picking, um, what can I talk about? Okay, DMSO for example, right? So for DMSO, right, if I'm going to draw in the partial charges, it will be delta minus over here and delta plus yeah so the delta minus at the oxygen will form favorable ion dipole interaction with the cations that's why it can solve it cations well but the delta plus is pretty well hidden yeah it's like surrounded by bulky groups um i think similar for dmf because for dmf delta minus delta plus the delta plus is the carbonyl carbon and of course, the lone pairs of electrons on nitrogen delocalize into the carbonyl oxygen, so it makes the carbonyl carbon less electron deficient. Yeah. And then for HMPA, you realize that the delta plus um, phosphorus is also relatively well hidden. Yeah. So that makes them not being able to solve it N ions well. Yeah. So they make the nucleophile, in this case the N ions, um, highly nucleophilic. Yeah. So much more reactive as compared to when they are in polar uh, protic solvent. Yeah. So uh, that might explain the reactivity, say, between um, the polar protic solvent, water and methanol, as well as DMSO, DMF, uh, cyanomethane and HMPA. And I think earlier on, you would have heard me. Why is it that it is the most reactive in HMPA? Well, I mean, from here, I think you can see that for HMPA, right? Um, even the delta plus, um, it cannot, it probably cannot even interact appreciably with the negative uh, charge or the lone pairs of electrons uh, in the azide. But say for DMSO, maybe a little bit, but not so well solvated. Yeah, so that can mean a hundred times difference in terms of reactivity. Okay, yeah, so uh, we will not dwell too much into it as mentioned earlier on um, solvent effect is not explicitly in the H3 curriculum, so we will not uh, discuss too much, right? And then for question 12, um, for the reaction between uh, CH3Y, so Y is a good living group, and X minus, uh, suggest the reactivity order when the reaction occurs in gaseous phase or uh, a protic solvent. Okay, so in that case, um, in the gaseous phase, we are simply uh, looking at uh, whether the lone pairs of electrons or whether the, the so-called the conjugate base okay, is a good base or it's a, it's a good nucleophile. Yeah, so in that case, I expect the reactivity of fluorides to be um, the fastest or um, yeah, the fastest the, or the most reactive uh, because fluoride is uh, the conjugate base of HF, which is a weak uh, acid. Okay, and then of course, uh, fluoride will be more reactive than chloride and chloride will be more reactive than bromide and bromides will be more reactive than iodides. Okay, but in the presence of polar protic solvent, uh, we are looking at uh, the other end of the spectrum because for polar protic solvent, I expect my fluoride to be well solvated. So well uh, solvated. And then I expect my uh, iodide to be poorly solvated. 
Yeah. So in that case, in a polar protic solvent, iodide will be the most reactive, followed by uh, bromides, and then uh, followed by chlorides, and then followed by uh, fluorides. Yeah. So the reactivity actually reverses. Okay, so uh, it will be good for, for you to, to take note of uh, ideas like this uh, in your discussion as well. Okay, so of course, uh, if I'm going to ask you in a H3 exam, uh, you'll be guided because remember, solvent effect not in your curriculum. Briefly explain whether the nature of the solvents is an important factor in determining the rate of substitution in SN1. SN1 has a carbo... Uh, cation intermediate okay so this is very important if i have a carbo cation intermediate a polar protic solvent will solvate the carbo cation intermediate well yes so uh in that case because the carbo cation intermediate is well solvated i expect the activation barrier leading to the carbo cation um, to be lower as compared to that uh, in a solvent where the carbocation is not as well solvated. Why is that the case? Uh, that is the case because uh, the transition state leading to the carbocation is expected to quite resemble that of a carbo I mean a tertiary carbocation in this case or or primary carbocation. I think um, we can go back to this. Uh, earlier part where I think we had something yeah so over this so we have a transition state so you notice that uh, regardless of whether we are looking at a primary a tertiary transition state or a primary tr transition state right we realize that for this particular transition state the developing negative and positive charge is quite prominent so, yeah so over over here so the developing positive charge is quite prominent so we expect uh, a solvent which is able to solve a carbocation well to also solve it the uh, in transition state relatively well. Yeah, because in this case, being a late transition state, the transition state um, resembles that of the carbocation. Yeah, so because of that, I would expect a polar protic solvent to stabilize the intermediate carbocation. Um, via an SN1 mechanism well. So therefore, uh, solvent effect is an important effect or important factor in determining the rate of uh, substitution in SN1. Okay, so with that, uh, we have come to the end of the review of uh, the activity 4 on uh, solvent effect, which is part D. Then uh, next, uh, please look out for further videos where uh, we'll be discussing some of the important ideas uh, in the lecture notes.